couple uh, things. One, I posted an approximate um, grade distribution, uh, as you can see here. And uh, that tells you where you stand. So uh, hopefully that, that helps you with uh, the exam. The overall average in the exam was 72, uh, which is pretty good. Pretty pleased with that, uh, meaning that you guys did fairly well on this exam. Uh, a lot of questions about regrading and so on and so forth in the exam. So if you had questions, a couple people asked me earlier if I, I could meet with them after class, and I said I was too busy, so I'm going to try to squeeze in a few minutes after class. If you have a question, ask me. But please, if you have not checked the key, please don't check with me until you check the key. Okay? So it's always your responsibility to go with the key first, and then the questions come. I can't answer 108 questions about why didn't I get this right uh, if the key already told you that answer. Okay? So if you haven't checked the key, then you need to do so. Okay, um, let's see, where are we? Uh, we are finishing up the structure of, um, and by the way, the uh, syllabus lay out, lays out exactly what you need to do about regrades and so forth. So I also recommend that you check on that. All right, so last time I got a sort of introduction, a structural introduction to um, the um, um, nu nucleotides. Today I'm going to... Um, finish up that, I'm going to talk about structures of DNA, structures of RNA, and then we're going to start talking about DNA replication. Okay? So that's kind of what we have ahead for us. Um, nucleotides, nucleosides, bases I covered last time, RNA and DNA um, are things I'm sure you've seen in a variety of places, but RNA um, would look like this. And DNA would be very similar, except for it would of course have sugars of deoxyribose, which would mean it would not have those oxygens. Um, that are on there, okay, at position number two. Now, um, the linkages, uh, what happens when we make a, a DNA or RNA molecule is we make a polymer. And the polymer is made by joining the nucleotide um, at one, of one nucleotide to another nucleotide, and that joining occurs through a phosphate. That creates what's called a phosphodiester. Phosphodiester describes the bond that is there between nucleotides. It's a phosphodiester bond. Okay? Phosphodiester bond. Because we have a sugar that has a, uh, within the nucleotides, it has a distinct orientation, the DNA molecule itself has a distinct orientation. Zimek, <coughs> we talk about the, uh, the, the numbered carbons in the ribose. So last time I said this was carbon number one. Two, three, four, five. We see that the phosphates are on position number five, and as we build a nucle as we build a nucleic acid, we build it in the five prime to three prime direction. This being five prime, that meaning that that's where the five, the carbon number five is. The new one comes in and attaches itself to the three prime hydroxyl, which is carbon number three. So it goes five prime to three prime. That's the direction of synthesis of every underline that every nucleic acid goes in the five prime to three prime direction. Now, we'll have more to say about this later. Uh, structure of DNA, very similar. Again, you see that you don't have that oxygen there. You have a hydrogen instead of a hydroxyl on the deoxyribose that's in DNA, but otherwise very similar. In each case, we're looking at one strand. We're only seeing one strand. If we had the other strand, it would be over here. We would see A paired with T, C paired with G, G paired with C, and T paired with A. Okay. Well, let's think about that double helix. Let's think about DNA. DNA exists in a double helix, uh, almost exclusively in the cell. There are very short regions of single-stranded DNA inside of cells, and we'll encounter those when we talk about DNA replication. But for the most part, DNA in the cell is double-stranded. You know that DNA has A paired with T, G paired with C. Everybody's known that forever. Um, the two strands are oriented with respect to each other oppositely. Okay? So if we have one strand that has, let's say, a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end, then the other strand is opposite. It has 3' prime end here and 5' prime end down here. So they're what we call anti-parallel. So 5 to 3 on this direction, five to three opposite down here. So that's, that's how they orient themselves. And that orientation, as I said, is called anti-parallel. 
The phosphates and the sugars are on the outside of the DNA molecule. The bases are on the inside. And not surprisingly, the bases are the least polar part of the DNA. So remember in proteins, the protein folded so that the least polar amino acids were on the inside. DNA's structure is consistent with that. The least polar uh, portions of the molecule are on the inside. Okay. There's the base pairing. The base pairing, A pairs with T. The thing that holds the base pairs together are hydrogen bonds. The things that hold the base pairs together are hydrogen bonds. You know from what I've told you so far, hopefully, that hydrogen bonds are relatively weak forces. The things that hold the nucleotides together within a strand are phosphodiester bonds. Okay. So between bases on two strands, we've got hydrogen bonds. Between nucleotides on the same strand, we have phosphodiester bonds. Okay. Notice that for AT base pairs, we have two hydrogen bonds. And for GC base pairs, we have three hydrogen bonds. Meaning, therefore, that we have more hydrogen bonds holding together GC base pairs than we have AT base pairs. Make sense? That means GCs are held together tighter. It takes more energy to pull them apart. And we'll see that's important later when we talk about transcription. Okay. Now, we have different forms of DNA that are out there. Different forms. What does that mean? Well, they have slightly different shapes. And they have different ways in which the strands twist around each other. So there's three primary forms that we talk about. The first form uh, that's the most common one is the form that was discovered by Watson and Crick back in 1953 using data they stole from Rosalind Franklin. They did. They admit it. They did it. Okay. Using that information, they found what's known today as the B form of DNA. And the B form of DNA probably has up to uh, uh, 90, 95% of the structure of the DNA in the cells. So a good deal of the DNA in the cells is in the B form. A related form to the B form is known as the A form. And it was actually a structure that was discovered by Rosalind Franklin. And in fact, her discovery appeared in the same issue of Nature in which Watson and Crick described the B form. It was thought at the time that it was a laboratory artifact because the way that she made the crystals of that that you have to do to, uh, the fibers of that that you have to do to study the structure, the only way that the A form appeared was when she used very, very dry conditions. And as we know, DNA, of course, doesn't exist inside of cells in very dry conditions. So it was thought, well, probably by the way that she made this, this was an artifact that was generated. We know today that the A form exists. Okay? The A form exists. It doesn't exist in a large percentage, but it does exist to a limited extent inside of cells. It turns out that where A form exists, the DNA tends to bend a little bit. And that bending may be important for helping to confine the DNA within cells. Helping to confine the DNA within cells. What does that mean? Okay. If you take all the DNA in a cell and you stretch it end to end, you've got seven feet of DNA. Seven feet. You've got to fit that DNA somehow into the cells, and that DNA fits into cells by being round, wound up in spool-like things. And these bends that are here may help to facilitate that. So A form may actually help to keep DNA fit inside of cells. Now there's a, a third form of DNA that was discovered in the late 1970s by uh, Alex Rich at, at uh, MIT. And when it was discovered, it too was thought to be an artifact, but it turns out it's got a much more important uh, function, it appears. Okay? This was a little harder to understand, so I'm going to try to explain it to you. And if you want to see a visual representation of it, come to my office and I've got uh, I will show you something that will, will depict it for you. You're not going to have to draw it, so don't worry. Okay? You're not going to have to recognize it, but you should know how it's different. All right? How is it different? It turns out that when you take two strands and you wind them together, there's actually two different ways they can be put together. One is the way I've drawn. The other is we can think of them as clockwise, counterclockwise. Okay? 
and they are distinctly different. We refer to them as being left-handed or right-handed. Okay? And if you come to my office, I can show you what right-handed means, or actually left-handed means very easily. Okay? Now, A form and B form of DNA are both right-handed forms of DNA. The Z form is left-handed. And when it was discovered, it was thought that is a laboratory artifact. There's no way in the middle of a DNA double helix that it's going to go right-handed, 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 and then all of a sudden flip and go left-handed for a ways and then flip back and go right-handed, because that's really the only thing it could do. Well, it turns out that appears to be exactly what it does. And we know today a lot more about how and why that does that. And I'm going to tell you a brief story about that. Okay? So it turns out that what causes a DNA a double helix to flip from the B form that it's present in most of the time to the Z form, which is the sort of backwards form that we can think about, depends on some tension that's in the DNA strands. You don't need to write this down. I'm just telling you the story. Okay? The tension that's in the strands, the salt concentration affects it, and the sequence of bases. So certain sequence of bases will prefer to flip compared to others. So GC, 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 for example, really likes to flip into the Z form when it can. You put it under a little bit of tension, the ones that you're going to see flip into the Z form are the GC, GC, GC sequences. Okay? Now, the story is this. It's a true story. Um, I run a summer undergraduate research program that's funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We pay students full time to work over the summer. I'm always trying to get students to apply for it, be of interest to it. And by the way, it's too late this summer. So if you're interested in that, I can't do that, help you this summer, perhaps next summer. But um, I'm always trying to get students interested in applying. And so I had a student one year. He was a, he was a sophomore. Um, I like to get freshmen if I can, starting as early as freshman year. Anyway, so I'm talking to students, and I'm telling him, I said, you know, I'd like to have you in the program. Well, he was very interested in biophysics. And I said, well, okay, I've got a professor in biophysics, and that was the chairman of our department at that time, uh, whose name is Shing Ho. And Dr. Ho was uh, formerly a graduate student with Alex Rich. Okay? I'm sorry, he was a postdoc with Alex Rich. Graduate postdoc, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, that's the person who discovered the Z form of DNA. So he was very interested in Z DNA as well. And Dr. Ho had written a way to calculate the likelihood that a DNA molecule would flip into the Z structure based on its sequence. Okay. And the program that he had was pretty complicated, and it took a computer forever to do it. And he told the student, he said, how would you like to optimize that program so we could make it run efficiently, and then we could test and see if sequences flip into B or Z or not? And the student had that as his project that summer. He loved computers. Okay. So the student did that. He took and he optimized this thing, and he could actually take a sequence of DNA and have the computer scan the sequence and then plot the likelihood of any given stretch of it flipping into Z structure, which is pretty cool. Just that alone was a great accomplishment as, as an undergraduate, especially as a sophomore in college. Well, that summer was the summer of 2001. It was also the summer when the first human chromosome sequence was published. And so they said, wow, we've got this entire now, this entire human chromosome. It's the first one whose sequence is out there. Why don't we run this through the program and see where in this chromosome that the ZDNA structure forms? And so he did this. Now, what the student became at that point was the first human being on the face of the Earth who knew the ZDNA forming regions of human chromosomes. Okay? He was a sophomore in college. He got a first author publication uh, for his work on that which was a pretty uh, awesome accomplishment. Today he is a, a graduate student. Uh, uh, no, I see a I'm not, actually, I'm not sure. He went off for graduate work, and I believe he actually has his PhD now. He went to, uh, I believe it was MIT, uh, for graduate school. Now, that was very cool. But then they said, well, this is, very, this is very neat. We can look at this, and we can see here is where the Z-forming regions. Now we're kind of curious. Do those have any significance in themselves? And so they said, well, where are all the genes in the chromosome? And guess what? What they found was that in many cases, the Z-forming region was very close to where an actual gene was. So what it turned out, it looks like that the Z-forming region may serve in the, in the cell as a flag for telling the cell where the genes are. 